Yeah, we don't have any. Welcome to a new uh, journal club read. Um, thank you for being here. We are going to read a very interesting article together. Um, and I'll talk about how we do that. So I want to introduce myself. I'm Liz McDonald, the um, leader of Aurorasaurus. And we have Laura Branch, the project manager. And we also have Francesca DeMare, who's going to be starting, is starting a brand new postdoc with Aurorasaurus. Um, and uh, we have Vincent Ledvina, who's a former intern and Aurorasaurus ambassador, and a few other people who are working in the space physics field, I think, as well as um, people who are Aurora chasers. And so we like to um, kind of keep, keep this um, basically kind of uh, low jargon and all questions are good questions. So if you want to put in the chat sort of like where you're coming from as far as um, any sort of background or like totally new to space physics or um, you know that sort of thing as far as reading papers like this, that would be great. Um, and any uh, kind of expectations or questions you might have about this, what you might want to get out of it, that would also be helpful. Um, but really welcome everyone. And what we're gonna do, um, Laura, if you wanna pull up the paper or put the link to the paper um, in the chat, uh, we, um, this is a classic paper by T. Neil Davis, who was a professor at the University of Alaska, really important um, in getting their rocket range going there. He's the author of a really um, accessible book about Aurora chasing called the, um, I think it's called the Aurora uh, Watcher's Handbook. It is out of print, but still, still quite good. Um, he, uh, this article is in Space Science Reviews, which means it's a review of a rural forms um, and their definition from, I think it's 1978, is that right? Um, so it's definitely a classic article um, and some of the, um, some of the field has certainly evolved since then, but because it's such an old article, it's um, a little bit simpler to understand and also see where some of the early definitions uh, came from and um, without, uh, I don't know, things getting all kinds of complicated like they, um, like they are nowadays in the literature. Um, yeah, so Laura, you want me to share? All right. Um, yeah, so we are uh, usually sharing a PDF and you can kind of do some markup on the PDF. Um, let me see. If you open the PDF and you want to um, comment on something like this is a review article. Um, which means it's all about this topic. Um, uh, so you can add comments to this. And so what we're basically gonna do is take turns reading sections of this article and um, try and uh, get the big picture um, and ask questions and talk about um, the uh, pieces that are important for, for you, whatever your questions are. Um, in some cases, I would generally say, especially if you're not too familiar with space physics or physics in general, um, we don't need a like complete understanding of all of these words, um, but there should be enough here that um, does give you some more context about the science and um, can be a starting point for learning more um, as you go. So. Uh, it's also interesting, um, especially the historical nature of this um, article. It's interesting for how it still influences the field today as far as these terms and then also like vintage observations and um, uh, what, what that looked like back then 40 years ago. Um, Okay, any questions before we get started? 
Um, okay. Uh, wanna welcome everybody again. And um, I think we're just gonna, I know Vince has been here before and Laura. So I'm gonna ask Vince to um, read the abstract and then we'll just talk about the abstract and then we will keep going. So Sounds usually like what plan. we do, oh, sorry, just as a quick and uh, quick note, what we usually do is we go paragraph by paragraph or section by section. Uh, somebody will read it and then give the best summary that they can. Please do not feel any pressure. I am not a science major at all. So um, I'm in the same boat as anyone who is figuring this out on the fly. Um, and then we'll talk about that together so that we can, we can look um, in more detail. So that's just kind of the format. Yeah. Yep. And you will see how it works when uh, we start here. All right. Go ahead, Vincent. All right. Observations indicate that the extended auroral arc is the basic form of the discrete aurora, the brightest and most obvious kind of aurora. Both motions of auroral arcs and their distortions into convoluted forms indicate the presence of shear processes involving substantial ch charge excess and magnetic field aligned currents. Consequently, strong electric fields, both horizontal and vertical, characterize the discrete aurora. The observations of auroral arcs and observations of associated charged particle fluxes, electric fields and currents fit together into a relatively cohesive description of the auroral arc, which is compatible with at least one proposed model of the causative process. On the other hand, an equally important type of aurora, pulsating aurora, exhibits quite different characteristics which distinguish it from the discrete aurora and which are difficult to interpret satisfactorily in terms of existing proposed models of particle precipitation and excitation of auroral emission. The lack of shearing behavior in the pulsating aurora indicates that substantial electric fields are not associated with it. Transitional forms of auroras exhibit an, an, an intermediate degree of shear motion. Right. Um, Vince, you want to say anything about this being an abstract or what it's about? Um, it's hard for me to like, you know, take it in and read it at the same time. So that's okay. Um, oh, Laura, I do you have any questions about any of these terms? Why? Yes. I'm so glad you asked. What is shear? <laughs> yeah. Anybody want to offer a definition of shear? I only know it in the context of sheep and wind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, in terms of wind shear, there's different uh, types of wind, different directions, different magnitudes of wind. So um, I knew you were gonna ask that and I don't actually have a precise, precise definition, but it's basically the variation in, in a quantity here. So um, that causes, gradients between different um, parts of the aurora, basically, but um, there might be a, a better, more pre mathematically precise definition. So if anybody has that, wants to offer a better definition of shear, that's drop it in the chat or on the article here. Um, Francesca, do you, are you familiar with that word and how you would define it? Yes, usually uh, with shear, I mention the, the movement between the two layers. So yes, it's the, the changing in the direction of the movement on something, uh, field, the velocity, I don't know. So this is in my mind with shear. Mm -hmm. I find the shear with, this, with that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's delve into the introduction of this article in which we are going to learn um, quite a bit about the state of auroral imaging back in the 1970s. So that's kind of cool. Um, would anybody like to read the first, um, maybe next two pages, basically? They're not too long. It's about five paragraphs. All right, that's enough wait time. I can do it. <laughs> okay. Thanks. All right. Introduction. 
In recent years, the application of two distinctly different types of imagery to auroral observation has greatly increased understanding of the dynamical morphology of the aurora. The application of television techniques to auroral imagery obtained from ground and aircraft-based platforms has allowed documentation of the rapid variations in auroras and the morphology of auroral structures in the range from a few tens of meters to several hundred kilometers. Very large scale images of the aurora have been obtained looking downward from the ISIS-2, Lee and Anger, 1973, and DMSP, Pike and Whalen, 1974 satellites. Whereas this form of aurora imagery provides informative global views of the aurora, see figure one. The temporal resolution is a factor of 10 to the five lower than with the television imagery, i.e. the satellite images are obtained at the rate of one per 100 minute orbit and the television images are obtained at the rate of 60 per second. Both types of auroral imagery have had profound effects upon our conception of what the aurora is like and both have modified the terminology in common use. The finding from the ISIS-2 images that there usually appeared to be a weak and diffuse zone of aurora lying at the low latitude edge of, or separated from, the zone of bright discrete auroras led to the names diffuse and discrete for the two types of aurora. These terms were rather natural since, to the eye at least, the weak aurora in the lower latitude zone did appear much more diffuse and ill-defined than the bright, sharply defined forms observed in the evening sector of the auroral oval and along its high latitude boundary in the morning sector. Can you scroll down? Sorry, maybe you want to pause right there. Oh yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, what Go I'm ahead. getting from that is video has been invented and we are now videotaping I'm sorry, I've just aged myself with that word. We are now video recording um, Aurora. Um, and uh, what they're saying is that they can get um, more frames with the auroras from the ground than they can from the satellites because of the way the satellites are orbiting the earth. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, video TV recording of Aurora was a big deal. Um, yeah. And they even uh, also did that from the space shuttle in the 80s. So um, faster, faster frame rate um, to get some auroral images. But uh, satellite observations, half the, the cameras, especially that you would fly at the time, weren't anywhere near as good as that. You couldn't just fly a, like a fancy video um, camera. So um, those satellite images were collected over the whole orbit, a hundred minute orbit. And so you're looking at the, um, a big section of the oval from space. And I was interested that um, DMSP satellites are still around. Um, ISIS-2, I think was, uh, I wanna say a Swedish satellite, possibly I could be wrong on that, but DMSP is Defense Meteorological something program, space program probably. And uh, those are still around. Um, so then they're saying that because we can now take a look at them, we can see different types of aurora and we can categorize them as diffuse, which are the sort of glowy blobby ones on the horizon and then discrete, which are the sort of ribbony ones that we tend to think of. Oh, Scott's asking a great question. What is the morning sector and the evening sector? And Liz, I believe you might have a 3D printed model that could explain that very well indeed. Yeah, yeah, so um, I can pull out the model, but this is a very important question because they use those terms throughout the article. And so basically what this is, is you have the auroral oval over the earth and the, um, it's moving with the earth. Um, so we're on, actually the oval's not moving, the earth is moving under the oval. So the observer is seeing different parts of the oval as the earth rotates. So the evening sector would just be for observers before midnight and the morning sector is um, for observers after midnight. So where is my magnetosphere? Um, in terms of the 3D printed magnetosphere that we have, uh, oh, it's a mess in there in the magnetosphere. Oh, anyway, can you guys see me? 
we have different sections of within the Earth's magnetosphere. And if you all are at the sun, and the Earth is in here, um, the Earth you is- You need here, to hold it up a little higher. There you go. The Earth is rotating under, um, under the auroral oval. So I should do it the correct way that the Earth rotates. Um, but basically, there are different regions within the magnetosphere. And our 3D printed magnetosphere model identifies like noon, dusk, midnight, dawn. So, Thank you. So you're rotating from dusk to midnight to dawn. Um, and uh, you see different characteristic types of aurora at those different times because um, the aurora is coming from um, what's happening in the magnetosphere and how that's being kind of convected around out here. And uh, the particles move different ways in different sectors because they have different charges and velocities and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, so I'm going to leave it there for now. And then why don't we... Um, I don't think we're going to look too much at the figures in this article. We're mostly going to like leave them for further looks, um, especially because they are not, um, they're like photocopied pretty poorly here. But um, you can still see, if you want to see some examples of um, what the aurora looks like from space, which basically that paragraph was saying like the, the key terms, discrete aurora and diffuse aurora are um, derived from the different looks of those types of aurora from space, mainly the discrete aurora being all of the high latitude stuff, and then the diffuse aurora being on the um, lower latitude edge of the oval. And that also corresponds to, um, from Earth, the magnetic field lines go to different distances. So the high latitude goes out further in the magneto tail and the low latitude um, connects to closer to the earth, which is another reason the physics is different. Um, okay, all right. All right. Do you wanna keep reading, Laura? Um, sure. Yeah, why don't you, or does somebody else wanna read the next page? I'm good with any. There's an educational thing called wait time where you wait until it's just a little bit awkward and then somebody usually answers. And, um, yeah, you don't have to read, but we yeah, definitely you know. appreciate it if people read. Um, Francesca, read would you mind uh, going yes, ahead? I, yes, sure. no problem. Yeah. In this review dealing with the observed characteristics of aurora, primary emphasis is given to two morphologically distant types of auroras discrete aurora larks and pulsating aurora. These two types, almost, but not quite, correspond to the discrete and diffuse aurora. Science pulsating aurora is a subclass of the diffuse aurora, just as is the hydrogen arc observed at the equatorial boundary in the evening sector. Another reason for not adopting the term diffuse is that this term implies a diffuse character whereas many of the forms one wishes to include in the classification are quite sharply defined. Such auroras appear diffuse to the visual observer or to the satellite scanner, either because of their weakness or because the contrast between these forms and the background is often low. As is shown in the companion paper by Shift 1978, the observed characteristics of the discrete aurora and the results of other measurement and chemical release experiment seem to fit together into a relatively cohesive picture suggesting that an understanding of the discrete aurora have been achieved. The same cannot be said for the pulsating aurora. Its characteristics are complex and puzzling. Most of the observation presented here together with some minor interpretation and summarized in table one. So 
it is not uh, practical to discuss the characteristic of discrete aurora arcs and uh, pulsating aurora simultaneously. There is value in summarizing the characteristics as in table one, partly because that way the contrast between the two types of aurora is easily apparent. To a sub substantial degree, table one form a compact summary of section two and three of this paper. Broader review of the topic of auroras are given in the monograph by Olmot 1971 and... Skip all the way down here. Yeah. And Valance Jones, 1974. A monograph by Aka Sofu, 1968, deals with the global substorm aspect of auroras and the related phenomena. Cool. So. Just generally what he just did in the introduction here is um, give some references to other papers of the time that are relevant to this topic. And then he also provided some kind of context of these terms and how they um, are pretty good terms, but not perfect terms and what that means. Um, and then introduced this pretty handy table that um, has some definitions. And in this case, in his table, he's um, specifically comparing discrete arcs and pulsating aurora. Um, and pulsating aurora did uh, used to be quite a bit more mysterious, um, especially because if you're just looking at it and you don't have sufficient satellite observations or rocket observations, uh, they didn't really know why it had such a weird different shape, um, but there's been a lot of work on that since then. So um, people have all kinds of different motivations when they write these kinds of articles, you know, they could have been trying to motivate, why do we need to study pulsing Aurora more or, you know, but, but really he's trying to, I think he's trying to um, uh, set up a useful comparison and um, make sure people know the difference between these two distinct types. Um, anything else like you questions you might things you might um, have noticed about this section you just read Francesca or or any other questions anyone? Um, Laura, I don't know if or Vince, I don't know if you're able to find some examples of those um, DMSP satellite observations, just so people, if people are interested, they can see what those look like better. Um, I forget the, the woman's Twitter handle who has all of them, the ones from Wisconsin, who typically uh, tweets them. There might have been some cool ones from last night. But um, so, what I'm thinking is I might summarize the table. I might take the table part and take us through that. And you guys can um, stop me and ask about this as we go. How does that sound? Um, and then we're gonna get into more of the details of like, especially, so for next they go into the discrete arcs and um, what those look like visually. And I think there's some great comparisons for Aurora chasers there. Very briefly, um, um, if anybody is wondering what these look like in photographs, I have put in the chat our, uh, our page from our website on uh, the common shapes of Aurora and there are photographs of each of these types there. Yeah. Um, Laura, do you, do you have, oh, it's you, Madison. Let me see. I'm looking for some of the images of satellite images of Aurora as well. Uh, Vince put it in the chat. Oh, okay, great, great, great. Okay, so here we have some definitions. Um, definitions are always good. Let's see how these definitions stand up. Um, definition of an auroral arc. The recognizable luminosity resulting from the impingement of a field aligned sheet beam of electrons or other charged particles upon the atmosphere, the luminosity being approximately proportional to the energy deposited by particles in the energy range 100 EV to 100 
um, thousand EV. So this is a pretty specific type of definition. Um, there are many different definitions of auroral arcs, um, but basically it's saying it's light from um, electrons or other charged particles from space that shoot down along the magnetic field lines. And um, that light is also proportional to how much energy those particles have when they come down. Um, and the reason for that is because um, those electrons from space, they hit the upper atmosphere and they lose a certain um, amount of energy in each collision. So you get more light if you have more energy because you can make more collisions. Um, let's see. Uh, the definition of a pulsating aurora here on the right-hand side, a pulsating aurora is one with maximum intensity never exceeding 10 kilorelis in 4278 angstroms, um, uh, which is, is that one of the green lines? I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I think it is the Probably. green line. Yeah. Um, and which undergoes at least one full cycle wherein there is at first a rapid increase, then a rapid decrease in intensity. The pulsations are usually re repetitive and often quasi-periodic. So yeah, this is blinking on and off. Um, and that is one of its defining characteristics of it being pulsating aurora. And then also this um, brightness that he cites, it basically means that it's, it's never especially bright. And when um, I just want to um, just want to clarify really quickly the angstroms and the green line that you're talking about for anybody who's not familiar with that. Are you going to offer the clarification? I or? will do my very best. Okay, so <laughs> um, there are special filters that are called spectroscopy filters that you can look at um, stuff with, and based on what light wavelengths get absorbed by the object and what gets reflected you can use it like a fingerprint to tell what it is that you're looking at um and a lot of times those correspond with colors or always i don't want to say always i'm i'm not enough of a scientist to say that um they they correspond with colors and so this particular um measurement is in green and corresponds to oxygen which is why the aurora tends to look green Yes, although the main green line is the 5577. So the 4278 okay. is actually, I want to say, one of the um, more blue lines. So more nitrogen lines. Uh, sorry, I'm blanking on this. Um, yeah, it's the 5577 is the main green line. We can find the... Um, characteristic. I just googled the the wavelength and a bunch of auroral studies came up so it must be mm -hmm. common. Yeah no I'm sorry I'm not remembering. Um, I think it is another one that is uh, specific and uh, indicative of uh, aurora and it's convenient because there's not a whole lot of other lines around 4278 so but I think it's mainly one of the nitrogen lines. Um, I'm not quite sure why they're referring to that there, but it's a detail and it's it's not the most important detail. So we will um, we can come back to it if and it might also get clarified further down here, um, like this in point um, four here. Um, okay, so moving on here, gonna go with. Sorry, Liz, wow. I want to add just yes. something. I was curious to know how long the pulsating aurora um, cycle lasted. And I found that the pulsating aurora is uh, this aurora form and the period typically range from a few seconds to tens of seconds. So this is the, the main cycle. Period. Yeah. And, and that is lower down in this table. So um, that's okay. like number eight in this table. Um, so both of these tables, they have quite a bit of further defining characteristics here that are helpful. Um, 
So we'll go through, let's start with the discrete auroral one. Um, number one, auroral arcs extend hundreds to thousands of kilometers in length, often parallel to the auroral oval. They occur singly or in multiple arrays. So this is talking about the really long discrete arcs. Um, the width of auroral arcs ranges from a minimum of 50 meters, which is a few electron gyro radii, which means that the electrons from space are um, precipitating down the field lines, but they're also um, spiraling around them in a, with a characteristic size radius. Um, so they, the arcs range from a minimum of about 50 meters to a maximum of order 10 kilometers. The boundaries are defined by steep gradients, which means uh, a bunch of light versus not light. Um, the lower border of an arc is sharp in consequence of increasing atmospheric density with depth. The altitude is defined by the maximum energy of particles in the primary beam and is typically 80 kilometers to 400 kilometers, but mostly near 100 kilometers. So this um, number three is all about the lower border specifically and how it's a sharp border because particles coming in lose all their energy when the atmosphere gets more dense. And so um, because they are colliding and that's how they're creating light. So the lower border is always brighter. It is the brightest. And then um, the particles are out of energy uh, and there's no more light there. Um, if they have more energy to start with, they penetrate down to um, lower in altitude. Uh, let's see. Um, the vertical extent to the diffuse upper border of these discrete arcs um, increases with the range of particle energy in the primary beam. It extends from a few kilometers to more than 100 kilometers. So all that he's trying to say there is that these arcs are tall and um, the upper edge where the light starts is kind of a, uh, just, you know, it, it's not a sharp border, it's a diffuse border. Um, uh, Liz, we have a comment from Joshua who unfortunately does not have a camera or a mic on the computer that he's using today. Um, he says more of a comment than a question and I hope this isn't too technical, but it says auroral arcs have an energy range of uh, 100 EV to 100 keV. This is interesting because today auroral electrons are considered to be less than about 25 keV. Higher energy electrons are considered to be quote, medium energy electrons, end quote. I assume it must've been clumped together back when the paper was written. Yeah, it's always sort of relative, uh, your own perspective, what you call high energy and low energy and medium energy. So, um, and I think you're right that there is a historical bias to this that um, 100 keV you know, in this case, what they're trying to define is the upper um, limits of those precipitating particles. And nowadays we don't um, quite worry as much about exactly what, like these are like radiation belt particles that are precipitating. And those are not the uh, primary drivers of auroral arcs. So this is kind of a high number. Um, and there's not very many of these. So it's probably true that both things are true, um, especially like what you're saying that the main auroral um, electrons that cause, that cause arcs are about 25 keV. Um, 10 to 25, the brightest ones I would say are more like 25. But then there's a range, there's a distribution of particles. So there could be a few that go up even higher. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Um, arcs typically occur in multiple arrays. The spacing between arcs is probably random, but there may be preferred spacing near two kilometers and perhaps near five to 10 kilometers. Um, this makes me think about 
how people have photographs of um, auroral arcs and uh, you can calculate the distance between them when you calculate the height of um, the different arcs. So this might be a parameter that, um, it's not a parameter that we typically extract from the, the ground-based images that we have, but it certainly could be, and it could indicate something about the driving processes, but um, yeah. Um, auroral arcs in the auroral ovals usually exhibit approximate conjugacy. Uh, what does that mean? That means that the northern and southern hemispheres are approximately symmetric, conjugate to the magnetic field line. They're on the same magnetic field line, so they look roughly the same. Um, it's just another way to say that. And hi, Donna, nice to see you. <laughs> um, all right, number seven, low intensity arcs tend to have uniform boundaries and curvature. They often exhibit a fine scale field aligned internal structure. The motion is less than that of bright arcs. Um, brighter arcs often develop vortex streets which means curls and rays, indicating strong localized inward directed electric field, often shown by differential shearing motions between closely spaced multiple arcs. These shearing motions, these kind of layered motions, constitute um, electric cross magnetic transport, E cross B. That um, in terms of the physics, that's a velocity vector, E cross B. Um, the perpendicular electric field associated with an individual arc extends laterally over a region 10 times the arc width. Um, the perpendicular electric field is largest near the boundary of the recognizable arc. Um, so this is some a uh, little more depth on the physics, and they're going to talk more about that when we get into the different sections. So I think we'll just um, mostly ignore it for now and come back to it when uh, they talk about it in the lower down in the article here. Um, arcs may be submerged in a region of uniform background electric field, which does not reverse direction across the axis of the arc. Um, similarly, that's a kind of a detail. There's a bunch of details here about what's going on with um, the physics of uh, you know, we see just the light. We don't see these um, background electric fields and all these other complex things that are happening. Um, this is important. There is upward electric current in the vicinity of bright arcs. Um, and the intensity is up to several times 10 to the minus six amps per meter squared. Um, but upward electric current corresponds to downward electrons. Um, that are causing the main arc. Um, in this case, he's saying convoluted arcs, which are bands developed from uniform arcs when field aligned currents perturb the direction of magnetic field to produce new um, sheet beam configurations, folds and spirals. The ensuing apparent motions imply a changing magnetic field orientation and do not result from E cross B velocity drifts in, a, in an electric static field. So that is a um, lot of physics right there, but it's talking about how, um, what makes the aurora fold and spiral up um, and how we know about that and how that's a consequence of the electric and magnetic fields in those regions. So it's very difficult to, visualize more actually beyond that um, from just the words, but, uh, but we'll see when they get into some of the cartoons. Um, and then they're talking about the magnitude of this perpendicular. And when we say perpendicular ele electric field, we're talking about perpendicular to the magnetic field, which is basically vertical in like Alaska um, at high latitudes. 
So perp to the magnetic field, which is the controlling sort of direction of all of this. All right. Um, now talking about bright arcs near the time of substorm breakup exhibit some pulsating 10 Hertz um, pulsating behavior that is also called flickering. Um, another cool thing that you don't see but can be measured is that there are upward oxygen. So coming from the atmosphere, oxygen is actually moving upwards along the field line um, at the same time that the electrons are moving down. So um, that's really cool. Uh, and then if you get more into the auroral literature, uh, especially with um, measurements of the particles over the poles through the auroral zone, you see what's called inverted V events in electron precipitation. Um, and those are coincident with these arcs, but basically the, uh, we'll see what those look like. They correspond to what energies are um, causing the arcs and the fact that the energy um, goes up in the center of that arc. So there's a lot of stuff there. This is just the summary table. This is a little bit of a dense article with a lot of physics, but we're gonna, we're gonna get through it. Um, there's also a whole lot of pictures. So <laughs> um, anybody have questions about this table on the discrete arcs? We are gonna go through this whole section on discrete arcs here um, in our next, probably as we go here. Um, I'll go through the. Oh, sorry, just a time. Yeah, few minutes left. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go through the pulsating aurora table here, and then we'll um, we shall skip around a bit and yeah. Okay, so I looked through the article yesterday, and I was like, oh, there's a lot of pages here, but some of the pages have all kinds of plots that we'll probably um, skip mostly here. But uh, does anybody want to read um, the pulsating aurora? table here. And yes, please add comments to the paper in the interim, Vince, or anyone. Um, I will probably stop you and talk about the pulsating aurora, but I want to give somebody else a chance to read if they want to be interested or to uh, do that. I can read. All right, go ahead. All right. Pulsating aurora characteristics. Number one, pulsating aurora occurs during the expansive and recovery phase of substorms and is most prevalent in the midnight and morning sectors, but also occurs in the evening sector. Number two, when both active discrete auroras, arcs and bands, and pulsating aurora occur simultaneously on a given meridian, the pulsating aurora lies equatorward of the active aurora. And so just to, um, how would you, what's another way to, to say that last sentence there? Um, I, mean, I mean, what I would say is like, if you're, I guess, putting it into like an aurora chasing perspective, if I'm out aurora chasing and there's aurora, there's aurora going on and there's discrete and pulsating aurora, the pulsating aurora is going to be higher in the sky, basically, because it's more equator word. Um, and it'll be above the discrete aurora. And then if you're, let's say you're right underneath the auroral oval, you'll see the pulsating aurora more towards, I mean, if you're in the Northern hemisphere, it'll be towards the South and the discrete aurora will be more towards the North. Yeah, yeah. So you could be somewhere like Fairbanks and you get to see both discrete aurora to the North and pulsating aurora to the South. Um, when you're an aurora chaser at lower latitude, you um, that's harder to see unless it's like a really big active storm. Yeah. But um, so you might see a lot more pulsating aurora um, closer to you. It's closer to you because the pulsating aurora is more southward. Um, but then you see those arcs further to the north and they're brighter. So those also get in the photos quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, just when they say on a given meridian here, they just mean north south over like all of Canada here. Um, that, uh, like at midnight in particular, 
um, you would have, you can have um, uh, pulsating aurora in the south and then these big active bands in the north as well. All right, let's read more. All right, number three, pulsating auroral forms are arcs, arc segments, arc-like but shorter, and patches of irregular shape. Widths of linear pulsating features are of order one to 10 kilometers. Patches have horizontal scale sizes of order 10 to 100 kilometers. Shapes repeat as forms quasi-periodically blink on and off. Pulsating forms are usually immersed in a uniform or irregular background emission of intensity up to a few kilo Rayleigh's in the N2 plus 4278, I'm assuming that's angstrom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Number five, the altitude of the background emission is high, 120 to 240 kilometers. The altitude of the pulsating form is low, 60 to 120 kilometers. Yeah, I don't know if that's something that you would typically notice from your, um, uh, from your photographs, but that there can be some, a little bit of glow in the background of pulsating aurora. Um, and then if you actually work out the altitudes, the pulsations are um, quite a bit lower in altitude. And one reason for that is um, the particles causing those pulsations, which this might not have been known at the time of the article, but the particles causing the pulsating patches are um, quite high in energy. They're typically higher in energy than your typical auroral arc. I would say. All right. Keep going. Yep. Number six, the height extent of pulsating aurora is sometimes, but not always. Number seven, some pulsating forms retain a fixed horizontal area during the pulse on phase, stable pulsations. Others grow laterally during the pulse on phase, streaming pulsations. Number eight, pulsating periods range from 0 0.3 seconds to 30 seconds. Number nine, a three plus or minus one hertz modulation occurs in more than 50% of pulsating auroras in the midnight and morning sectors with modulation up to 20% of that of concurrent slower pulsations. Yeah, so um, there's a number of like weird characteristics here of pulsating aurora. Um, number six is one that uh, I've actually personally studied and isn't studied all that often, but um, basically uh, pulsating aurora can be super thin and not follow the, this is not fully understood why it's so thin still, um, because particle precipitation should distribute those particles all along the field line, um, but the ionosphere might have a role in um, keeping these patches and their light only confined to a few kilometers in altitude. Um, yeah, there's a lot to um, that can be studied from photographs of pulsating aurora here too. Uh, all right, we got more details here, getting into the technical parts here, all right. All right. Number 10, pulse shapes range from widely spaced half sine to closely spaced square waves. Number 11, pulsating auroras show east-west drift motions up to one kilometers a second, which may be E cross B drift motion, but which are not always E cross B motion. Number 12, radically different pulsating behavior can occur on proximate flux tubes but pulsating auroras do not exhibit shear motion phenomena. Number 13, exactly in-phase conjugate pulsations do occur, but other observations suggest that not all pulsations are conjugate. Out-of-phase conjugate pulsations have not been observed. Can we stop here and break yep. this apart? Um, so there's a lot of like hedging of bets here. Pulsating aurora are kind of difficult to characterize, but um, Number 11 uh, has an important note, which is that the pulsations, you may see them drift slowly um, east to west. And that is a, a speed that can be estimated from photographs as well. Um, and number 12, um, 
Vince, do you know what proximate flux tubes are? Some good jargon there. I would just, I mean, when I, I don't know for sure is the answer, but what I'm thinking is that if you think about like the field aligned currents and like the field lines, you have your flux tube. Each one of those has a flux tube. And if you have proximate, that means that they're close together. So you could have different behaviors on basically pulsating patches that are close together. And it doesn't exhibit like shear motion phenomena. So you don't have like a weird, I don't know, whenever, whenever I think of shear motion, I think of two moving sort of interfaces. And when you see discrete arcs, sometimes it looks like they're kind of moving together or like, you know, yeah. doing some kind of like bumping up or like rubbing together. But with the pulsating, you don't see that. Yeah, that's a really good demonstration of the shear. And I think that's all they're trying to say is that um, the pulsations can do radically different things near each other, but it's not a shear type of motion yeah. generally. Um, all right, number 13. Um, so exactly in phase conjugate pulsations. What they mean by that is that conjugate, so north-south hemispheres um, in phase, meaning turn on and off. So if you picture a pulsating patch, a single patch that is on this conjugate flux tube, the same field line north to south, um, it's going on and off in phase with each other. So um, they're saying that that has been observed. Um, and uh, that would be really interesting because the particles are that come from space and the way pulsating aurora happens is um, you know, there's, there's a travel time between north and south and particles are um, typically bouncing between north and south. So there can be a delay time. But um, in this case, it's interesting that they're saying they turn on and off at exactly the same time, although not always. Um, however, they have not observed them on and then off. Um, totally out of phase in these conjugate hemispheres. Um, so does that make sense? It's uh... mm -hmm. all right, Keep all right, going. all right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're almost almost to the end of this one. Yep. Number fourteen: fluctuating electron fluxes depositing maximum of several ergs, one over centimeters square seconds to radian in the energy range 50 electron volts to 100 kilo electron volts occur above pulsating aurora. Outside the atmosphere, backscatter cone electron fluxes are isotropic. Number 15. Oh, should I stop there? I'm going to skip that one. Well, that's okay. a whole other class. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, go, we'll, we'll just ignore that sentence. Yeah. <laughs> Number 15. Above pulsating aurora, increases in proton intensity correlate with increases in electron intensity. The proton spectrum soften, softens as the electron spectrum hardens, greatest proton intensity near pitch angle 90 degrees. Number 16, particle distributions above pulsating aurora tend toward isotropic or flat rather than field aligned. Hmm. Okay, these are um, details of the physics and the way the distributions of the particles look when you measure them above the pulsating aurora. Um, and that's uh, interesting because it's, it's a way to um, indicate what's happening or to infer what's happening further out in space. But basically you're trying to infer that from where you measure it and the number of particles as a function of energy um, and then extrapolate that out to this you know, huge magnetospheric space. So it's a, it's a, it's a hard to make that connection exactly. Um, anybody have any questions here? We have gotten through the introduction. That is good. Um, I am thinking we will probably uh, continue with the discrete next time, and we may or may not get to the pulsating aurora part. Um, so I think if you want to look at the section on um, pulsating aurora, that would be great to look at in the meantime, uh, because there's not all that much there, actually. 
I'm not sure why it's not loading for me, but um, there's a bunch of plots and you can ignore most of those. Um, and there's a few descriptions of other types of diffuse aurora, but we will focus on the discrete next time. Um, and then this is a good question, Josh, are the auroral ribbons that we see in pictures just a series of auroral arcs or is the ribbon just one large arc? Um, uh, Donna, do you have anything to say about that from your observations perhaps? It depends on the picture. Um, I think what we're talking about here mainly is that the, I, I'm gonna say the ribbon is usually one big arc that has folds. And what we're gonna learn about next time, July 22nd, please come back, is how the um, uh, ribbons in the current um, sheets, in the current sheets of the Aurora uh, fold up and how that's been studied and how that happens uh, in different directions. Um, there's both spirals and there's curls and there's little folds. Um, I, yeah. I, I looked at this diagram before and then I went to my pictures and, and it was very interesting how you could identify the difference between a spiral and a curl. But uh, other than that, I have, I have way too much to learn to... Uh, well, that's another um, good assignment is to see if you have any cool pictures of spirals versus curls. Um, I also noticed when I was reading this article, sort of skimming it yesterday, that there are some cases where um, you can have both spirals and curls. Um, and they, the key thing here is that they're rotating in different directions. Uh, so that's one way that they would be um, different. And that would be a very cool fiber arts project as well, Laura. So um, yeah, let's bring some examples next time uh, so that we can compare to these um, cartoons because the cartoons are, uh, you know, like highly oversimplified here, like this figure eight, um, literally the, the edge of, the figure is, or the boundary of the figure, one edge is the outer magnetosphere along the field lines, and one edge is the ionosphere. Um, and so truly that's a very long distance. Uh, and then the perspective of this figure is a little funny because um, basically it is drawn like it looks um, so that it's compared to, um, what you see in the photographs of what the aurora is, but I think it would help to see the real pictures to, um, to do that. And one thing to note is the difference in size of them as well, how that, I, I think I've seen the, the curls right just at breakup. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. spirals will, will happen short after that. But I... yeah, and the spirals can be a lot bigger here. So yeah, that's a key part of this um, simplified diagram that's labeled here. Um, kind of, and it might not be obvious, what is DIA period? Uh, it's diameter. So that's the diameter of the curls being from two to 10 kilometers ish. And the diameter of the spirals being, you know, tw um, double that up to, um, you know, more than double that, uh, 50 times more or something like that. So um, 1500 kilometers is a really big distance. And I'm gonna, let's see if I, are you guys still seeing the YouTube channel? If I click on Vincent's um, link here, because I'm hoping you have a gorgeous example of a very big spiral here. I have, a, so, I have a nice spiral now on you. Yeah. I don't yeah. see the video yet, but I think it's still loading. Yeah, I think my computer is needs a reboot this morning. It's very slow. I'm not even on the NASA VPN, but um, okay. Uh, while we wait for that to come up, um, want to thank everybody for coming, and um, we will be 
back in two weeks and we'll dive more into the article. Feel free to read, get pictures, ask questions. Um, we hope this is useful. Uh, it can be a lot to get into um, uh, journal articles like this. So you don't always read them in order, but I think in this case, it's kind of um, nice to get the whole introduction and the whole summary table and uh, sort of be oriented to where we're going here. Um, this article does get pretty technical in terms of the physics. So, all right, I've muted your lovely, whoa. Sorry. This was in Alaska earlier this year. Yeah, so this is a big spiral. Is it going the same way? Um, Vince, I, to be slightly more quantitative on this, um, I'd love to know which direction is um, east-west here. Um, this is actually coming from west to east. So everything was moving from west to east. So this is traveling east, which is weird. So where is west in this picture? It's no, it's on the top of the picture. Um, no, west is west is sort of on the bottom right. Okay. Yep, yeah. and east is on the top left. And then this is north over here, or this is north. Well, um, the I, that's, that's is north. To... North, north is towards the top, top cool. of the frame, and south cool. is towards the bottom. Cool. This is really great. Um, uh, if you take a couple screenshots and line them up compared to, and label the directions, and then line them up compared to the cartoon, that would be fantastic. Um, do you have any idea how much time that is? How fast this is running here? That's all real time. So, like, that's oh, okay. like one second equals one second. Hmm. So cool. it was really fast. Yeah, this one was really fast. I'll be curious what they say about that in um, in the article. So, and then also, um, Laura mentioned this earlier, but we do. Uh, it's a fun name to call this the cinnamon roll aurora as well. So, because um, it does look like a nice cinnamon roll. All right. Uh, Thank you guys very much. Um, sorry we didn't get too far into the article. Hopefully this is um, inspiring to start to look at your pictures and appreciate your time. And we hope you will come back and learn more with us and uh, we'll get more, more reading. And um, yeah, I can stick around if anybody has any more questions, but definitely want folks to, um, to uh, feel free to jump off and Great. yeah. Thank you so much. This is fantastic. Yeah, I and, wish I could learn faster. But. Oh no, this is some serious physics here. So <laughs> this is, uh, uh, that's why we have a whole variety of people on the call. And Donna, um, you missed um, inter being introduced to some of the other folks here. Um, but we have Francesca, who is a new um, 